Well, welcome everyone once again to uh, Bear Analytics Event Insight Webinar Series. We're glad you join us. Every week we have these at uh, at noon, and today we're we welcome two special guests um, from our friends over at High Road Solutions. We're joined by Amy Pagano, who's the Director of Programming for High Road, and Ron McGrath, who's the CEO of High Road. So they're going to talk to us about uh, trends in attendee marketing including the solutions, technology solutions that uh, today's event organizers are adopting here as we see uh, folks getting into the digital realm and, and talking about digital evolution. So we're excited about that and excited to have them. As always, if you have any questions at all um, throughout today's program, feel free to put those in the tr in the chat there on the side. You can send them to me directly. My name is Eric Misick. I'm, I'm uh, kind of just opening things up here for Bear. Um, and we'll get to those questions. Well, we won't wait to the end. We can get into them in real time and, and get uh, those burning questions answered uh, by Joe, uh, Amy, and Ron here. So with that, we'll kick it over to Joe Colangelo, our CEO, is going to bring us uh, through today's discussion. All right. Thanks, Eric, and welcome, Amy and Ron. Let's get things kicked yeah. off by getting folks to know you both a little bit and High Road Solutions. So whoever wants to go first, let's give a little bit of an overview, and then we'll get right into it. I can uh, I can go first. Um, I'm Amy Pagano, not to be confused with Ron, who I believe right now has a, a label on him that says Amy Pagano as well. <laughs> so, you're, you're, you're that cool. He's trying to hijack yeah. your brand, I think. Yeah. Right They've cloned me in some way. Um, I'm the director of programming over at High Road, so um, I wear multiple hats, but um, I would say just to simplify into two camps, one, um, I do consultative work um, just around kind of data activation, data integration, digital marketing, uh, strategic marketing. Um, and then on the other end, uh, more the corporate or I guess self, um, self-serving end for High Road, um, I'm more on the product dev and content strategy side. So, so thank awesome. you for having me. Yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Thanks for having us and allowing us to join. I'm Sam so McGrath. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at High Road Solution. Probably the least important person at the organization at this point. Um, my day-to-day -day is actually trying to figure out where I can serve the, my team and, and basically our clients, uh, who we consider partners. And so basically, High Road Solution, we help associations get more out of their digital marketing platform. We're platform agnostic. Uh, and we do that through integration and activating the data, the rich data that they actually have from their source systems that we bring into the marketing platforms of their choice. And so we work with uh, associations in terms of how they're digitally evolving and how to activate on campaigns uh, based on that rich data from their source systems. All right, well, appreciate that background. Now let's get right into the discussion. So I heard a couple of things there just in the intros alone, right? platform agnostic, data, there's digital transformation discussion points going in there. Obviously not just a buzz kind of themes or uh, ethos across the association, but across event organizers in general. Yeah. Why don't you just level set for the audience here? A question I like to kick these discussions off with is, you know, from your purview, how are you, how, how would you describe the current state of especially audience acquisition and marketing in the event marketplace. Yeah, um, I'll start and then maybe um, Ron can jump in, but um, it's super exciting where we are and I think it's um, iterative or it kind of, it's, everything is evolving, but I think that everything is, we're, we're seeing a culmination right now um, within the association landscape um, and that's where um, from you know a generational perspective, a cultural perspective, an environmental perspective, um, everything is coming together to kind of almost rewire market demand. So we are seeing now, um, and, and we're going to continue to see, and I would say within the next two to three years, we're going to see a huge shift where the kind of the baby boomers generationally, um, they sunset, right? Um, and that's within probably the buying market and within the workforce. So for associations, this is huge. They're going to go down to like 15%. Um, Gen 
Y is going to come up to about 50%, some of those, some of which are going to be joining the Gen Xers in leadership positions um, at organizations um, and in, a, you know, kind of more buying capacities. And then we finally have Gen Z that's coming in around 10%. So they're actually entering the workforce. Um, just thinking through all of these different, like the behavioral attributes related to these newer generations. So you've got, you know, pricing sensitivities, you have um, um, buying expectations, mo you know, modeling expectations. This is going to be a huge change, and, and this is what we're already seeing. Um, and so as such, it's no longer for specifically for member-based organizations, associations, nonprofits. It's no longer if you build it, they will come kind of mentality. Everything is changing. Um, content strategy, content development, um, event strategy, um, the way event delivery, all of that is going to be changing. Um, and I would say, you know, it's not just as going, we're already here, right? We're already seeing these changes, um, but certainly it's going to escalate escalate within the next couple of years. Okay, so per, seeds of change are here, just like the fall weather's changing quite literally around us, right? Yeah, right. So much change, I buy it, I believe it, we're seeing it firsthand. Talk to us about how there's the augmentation, the interplay, the assistance of technology, or maybe those are all the wrong kind of descriptive words. Um, may, maybe maybe it shouldn't be a technology first approach. I'll play a little bit of the antagonist here a little bit. Maybe you know, kind of coach me otherwise. Yeah, and I I um I totally I actually totally agree. So there I think it's a component. It's three different um elements. And not to once again I I like to oversimplify sometimes, but um it's three different elements. I think that there is a technology component, and and within that there is a data component. Right, that's changing in the way that we're collecting inbound, outbound data, um, business intelligence, predictive analytics. Um, but the most important um, is the the kind of principles and the people that are serving, that are behind these platforms. You know, the methodologies um, that they're using. So it's entire mindsets that need to change with this, and that that is really the most important piece, right? Or the the frameworks and the principles behind it. Um, that support um, the technologies and the data that's really more um, kind of like executionary, I would say. So, so and, and, I, and I love this because I think this is probably where maybe if organizations haven't gotten off to a quick start on their digitalization, mobilization, or that journey, their technology adopting journey, it's usually because the tech is leading the strategy with it. Yep. I'm hearing you correctly, yes. Amy, it's... No, no, strategy better be the horse, and then the tech is the carriage. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah when, we, when we come into an organization to help them, you know, a lot of times there's a change in the platform, the marketing platform, but typically what we find is that that's not where the problem is. The problem is a lack of strategy, and so what we try to do is, I mean, the key thing is, a lot of the marketing platforms are similar. If you're dealing with a powerful omni-channel platform, they have the same feature functionality. They might execute a little bit differently. Can but, you give us a couple of brand names just so folks know what you mean when you're talking omni-channel? So when I when I'm talking omni-channel, I'm talking about HubSpot and Marketo and you know platforms like that on that level that basically allow you to speak to your actual member or potential member in the medium that they want to hear from. And so that, I think that really intersects well with what Amy has said is because the value proposition of associations is still the same in terms of it's a place to network, it's a place to learn, it's a place to, you know, of community. But in terms of how you reach different generations and different people in terms of preferences, you need to be able to be able to reach out in all those different modalities. And so omni-channel platforms allow you to speak to people through social if you want to, over email, through the website, however however they prefer. Um, and then also you want it to be journey-based. So it's not you know based on what just you want to say as an organization, but it's based on why the member joined in the first place and the value they see. And you okay. have to kind of sift that through the data and then let the journeys basically be personalized to each person so that they get the value from your organization of why they originally joined. Um, but if you're not thinking that way and you don't have that foundational strategy, then you won't deploy the technology in the proper way. And so I think that, um, you know, we're kind of all 
agreeing on the same thing, which is I'm a big technology person. I'm a software developer by trade, but I use software to solve human problems. And that's, you know, we're starting with a human problem and the technology is an enabler. It's not the solution. It's an enabler. So unpacking that a little bit. Sorry, Amy, go ahead. I was I was just going to say, I mean, I love the way that Ron says it, but it, it really is that way. Let's say you were to kind of move forward with an investment in an omni-channel platform such as HubSpot. You could do it. Um, and that's, I mean, that's great. You're, you're, you're thinking in the right way. Um, but we've seen so many organizations fall in pitfalls where they purchase it and they're not behind the methodology or the practices or processes behind it. And they use it as a glorified email tool. And, and that's, you know, that's doing no one good, an outbound okay. communication tool. So um, it's important that your entire organization be culturally on board um, with the, with the, the movement, not just the investment in that platform. I, mean, I want to double click on that as they say. So we got two organizations, right? They both just moved to HubSpot. One's taking the strategy first approach, one's taking the tool first approach. Walk me through kind of the next step on from a case study standpoint. So if they're taking the tech first approach, you said a glorified email tool. Yeah. Paint me a picture so, of what that looks like. Because I think if there's some folks in the audience, they probably want to know what side they're on or maybe how they fit in the middle. Yeah, so I, I'll take the what we see in terms of kind of the uh, momentum and the energy. So the good news is the association space, a lot of people are talking about omni-channel platforms, right? So we mm -hmm. talk with a lot of associations that are trying to move from uh, basically a email marketing platform. Some might, you know, depending on how you use it, uh, it's definitely great for communications. A lot of what associations do is communications. But when it comes to marketing, how do I cre create net new members? Now that's going to be marketing. And so typically what you'll see is the good news is, again, they're, they want those platforms. They're investing in those platforms. But even though um, that's happening, there's a hope and you want to kind of I think a lot of organizations aspire to the model of what the methodology that comes with the platform, which is inbound, which is content marketing, but momentum and change are hard. So you'll mm -hmm. see people kind of fall back into old patterns, right? So you buy an omni-channel platform, HubSpot. So you have association A and B. I'm going to say what tend to happen, and then I'll let Amy tackle what you would like to see happen, right? So what tends to happen is everyone has a lot of good hopes, and they understand at a high level, okay, we want to be more personalized. We want to go for journey-based approach. But then you get the platform. Um, you basically uh, don't have all the time and the resources, and then you fall into old habits, which is, okay, I'm going to send out emails to an audience. I'm not basically setting up uh, journeys that are being triggered by what they're doing or not doing based on data in the source system or on the website. And so people come into it with a lot of good aspirations. But small teams, basically the momentum of how things used to be um, and not maybe having all the proper data in there to activate on campaigns, they go into the old habits. And then you've got basically, you know, um, you're basically using a cannon as a fly swatter, right? You know, so if I'm, if I'm <laughs> hearing you correctly, you're, you're, you're purchasing and bringing out an omni-channel marketing platform, but you're really only still using one channel, like by and large, right, right? right. Like it's so, still kind of that main lane that you're used to driving down and then maybe you'll bleed in here and there, but it's not. Yeah, so ex exactly. Yeah. So to okay. quote one of my, my friends, uh, 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 Mark over at uh, Association Analytics, he was, uh, we were talking and uh, I was telling him what we do. And he basically said, so he kind of dilutes everything down. He says, so basically you're saying that if someone doesn't talk to you guys, they should just use MailChimp. And so that's the same concept. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, Amy, when it's done right, what's the world look like? Yeah, and I was I love the analogies. I I actually had written a a blog on you know essentially saying you know don't purchase purchase a, a Yeti um, bike and then ride it around the block like a Yeti bike which is meant for mountainous. It's like this muscular bike and and ride it around the block and that's what happens when you purchase like a HubSpot and then you use a fraction of that like you know as an you know falling back to kind of legacy ways so the right way to do it if you were to do this is there's you know an entire framework where you're taking a look at your audiences um 
you know, HubSpot has coined the word personas. Um, if you are using a different tool, you could say database audience or database segment. Um, but you're really taking a look at your audiences, looking at all of the data that centralized behaviorally, demographic, um, firmographic, psychographic, looking at the entire data story, and then building these kind of compelling um, content-based journeys from there. So in other words, and this is the best use case, um, because it happens all the time, we see it with organizations. They, you know, they get this omni-channel, this powerful, powerful tool to build these journeys. A conference is coming up. It's, you know, they have a, you know, if it's an on-site conference, maybe a six-month window or something to pull this from a planning and a, you know, planning perspective and a marketing perspective together. And they, and then they react, right? They follow the same patterns of early bird registrations coming up. Um, you know, reg registration is closing, and then they start just sending out outbound emails. They fall back on the traditional ways, right? When in fact, they could be running a an evergreen campaign year round based on audience versus oh we have this program we want to promote our conference our flagship event event it's based on the audience where there's a mike smith who essentially fits this criteria is, has these different behavioral attributes has attended these webinars hit this website um read these blogs and oh by the way has a strong would have a strong entrance interest in this conference track and so that's a ready-made audience right there um, and so it's just building that timing um, opportunistically building that timing into the camp into the Mike Smith campaign not the conference forward campaign to basically say hey Mike we've seen you know you're interested in this track most likely attend our conference so it's flipping it on its head it's not program for forward campaigning it's persona forward campaigning Persona forward campaigning. So let's talk a little bit about this in action. You guys run your own events, right? So how do you, what is it, eat your own dog food? Is that the term, right? Yeah, so what, is that, what is yeah, that? What is that? Drink your own Kool-Aid. Yeah, about, drink yeah. your own Kool-Aid's better. Yeah, I don't know who's eating your own dog food. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah, and, and we do, um, you know, in everything that we do, um, we like to lead by example. I like your analogy much better. Mine's boring, but um, yes, we do have our own conference. Um, this is, um, it's an open conference. Um, it, it is for um, both our clients and for prospects. Um, at, at the moment, mostly, um, we get mostly clients, but we're also getting, this is turning a little bit into um, a lead gen tool for us as well. Um, and we take a very different approach, um, just knowing our own personas, um, you know, those that we're reaching out to from a client and a prospect perspective, just knowing them, knowing what makes them tick. Um, we actually go very thematically um, with our event. And so that is year over year. Um, we choose typically something that's very mainstream, classic, um, you know, like a movie or a series or, you um, something that's going to resonate with our audience and we carry that string throughout our entire event. So in the past it's been Stephen King, um, you know, series to, well, what else? Run Back to the Future um, oh, yeah. series as well, future, yeah. you know, like Wizard of Oz, you know, all these classic themes that resonates, it's multi-generationally because we know that our personas, you know, kind of um, fit, there's different personas with different generations, but all of it can connect on this level. Um, this year, all right, we just had a Vercon event that just took place, um, and this year it was a break. It was based on Breakfast Club, which is probably one of my favorites. Um, but it was uh, called Break Fast from the Legacy Club: Reinvent Your Future, and it's all it's entirely focused on this concept of. Um, digital evolution, data transformation, whatever you want to call it, reinventing yourself um, based on what's happening in the landscape. So, um, And what was the modality? How did, how did you guys deploy this event? Was it virtual, hybrid, in person? It was, um, it was virtual. Yeah, it was entirely virtual. Um, and we've been doing this entirely virtually, um, which is always... Um, it's, it's, you know, maybe in the future we would look at doing something that's a little more hybrid. I don't think that we would ever get away from the virtual aspect because quite honestly, once again, we're feeding into those generations, um, those newer generations, but also on a most self-serving level, when you're doing 
when you're executing a virtual conference in some way and you're doing it right and you're creating that experiential event, you are um, you're collecting digital interactions that can can jumpstart journeys, you know, in, in such a more I guess efficient way. You can still do it in person, um, but in such a more efficient way. Um, is you know so that you're kind of getting that lead or getting that you know that engagement um, that much further. So, well, there's definitely certainly more data I would imagine available when you're deploying a virtual event just on yes. par. And it sounds like if I heard you correctly, I mean you're using that. You said I think the term you used was to kick off the journey. So you're pulling that engagement data in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely correct. So in, in a lot of ways, we're going to, we are using, and we happen to use HubSpot ourselves, um, we are using HubSpot to identify those um, those personas um, with specific interests that have alluded to specific interests or have specific attributes um, that lets us know they would be interested in this event. And once again, that's omni-channel. That's everything they've, they've consumed. Mm -hmm. But, um, so we're taking that and then, then now we have a captive audience and that now we're seeing um, everything that they've downloaded, um, everything that they've chatted, uh, whether they attend, whether they registered, whether they got it on demand, and then um, from all of those are, you know, conferences are huge incubators, right? It's breeding ground for content for, for associations. So um, it, it lets you create these nice little content journeys um, and program map to, to what the organization is actually doing. Um, you know, selling at that point, or it couldn't even, it doesn't even have to be selling altruistically, kind of just getting, um, getting their members engaged in, um, and you can kind of platform from there. So we even have like conference lead scoring um, that we use within, within HubSpot. All right. So I got a, I got a couple of questions kind of coming <laughs> out of, of, of those last two or three thoughts there. Um, uh, you know, folks in general, the general sentiment is it's it's hard to make a nickel running kind of a virtual event. But I think if I heard or maybe read between the lines of what you just said, there's a way for you to understand content interactions to maybe be informative on new products, align it with current products. And, and in other words, tie it in some way to, you know, a positive financial outcome that might be different than just buy a badge or buy a booth or something like that. Can, yep. can you, you unpack that a little bit? Is that? Yep. You, you said it perfectly. Um, and I don't, um, Ron, feel free to, um, to chime no, no, in. I, I, you know, the thing is that, so with COVID and stuff, we've had these hybrid events and we've talked about this before guys, which is there's pros and cons to each one, which is the in-person event. There's a networking component. We, uh, we all have opinions on how to maximize that through experiences. What's nice mm -hmm. about digital is it gives you reach and it gives you a, access to a ton of behavioral data. So Joe, like for example, if you're with your guys platform, there's a ton of behavioral data in there and it's mining that data. Um, and so, you know, we were at inbound that was HubSpot's conference. They, so they had about 10,000 people uh, in person, which is really pretty large, but they had 60,000 people in totality. So think about the amount of behavioral data that they have in their event data that can be parsed and figured out in terms of how to drive journeys and kind of deduce, um, you know, people's preferences and, you know, kind of more of, um, it's almost kind of first party data in a sense, you know, it's not like a direct survey, but yeah, it is a survey like, okay, I had 20 sessions I could attend and I chose to att attend these four. What does that tell you that I'm interested well, in? Well, they're voting with their time instead of filling in the bubble, right? Or exactly. Drop down. Which yeah. is a lot, in a lot of cases, a lot stronger. Sorry, go ahead, Ron. Yeah. So, so I think that's why, you know, obviously we work with you guys, we have a partnership and I think the event side, the virtual event side, especially has a huge amount of behavioral data in terms of tapping into that to drive these omni-channel platforms. But that's what I think we're kind of coming back to, which is the platform is only as good as the data that you're putting into it to drive the actual personalized journeys. And so that's a, you know, a big piece of it. Yeah, there's definitely the undertone, you know, obviously, well, what, what's the data guy gonna say? There's obviously the undertone of information and, and data that's, that's available. I think you said it, you hit the nail, uh, you know, right on the head in terms of different events are going to offer 
different experiences and different value centers. And you're going to see the same thing, frankly, on the data side, right? There's, there isn't like any silver, silver bullet as to like this particular modality or this feature. All, people ask us all the time, what platform should I be using from data perspective? It's like, well, there is no perfect data platform because data is just the exhaust or the byproduct that comes out of these experiences. And exactly. so you have really small events that are Muhammad Ali punching way above their weight class because there's just a massive amount of engagement, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, yeah. it's, it's pretty crazy. No, Joe, I think that's a good point because I think that people look at events or association look at events in terms of a revenue driver, which it is. There's a direct revenue driver, but then there's the kind of the oil of today, which is data. Right. So maybe also looking at events and putting a price on not just how much registrations that you generate in terms of revenue, but what is the amount of data you generate at the exhaust you said from that event? Because it is going to be more valuable over time than that one time point in time revenue you generated off that one event. Yes. So, I, I, the mindset I, needs to change that the data needs to be treated as an asset. You would never leave your purse at the park. Yet all the time people are leaving the information in and around their events in platforms and using it like cloud storage and then trying to come back four or five years and going, where, where, where did I leave that name back? Where was that again? <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. I love how, I love the, that you used exhaust. I think that's, that's so perfect. Um, and I, it, you know, back to kind of what you were originally saying and, you know, tying revenue to the event, no, maybe you can't do it as much at the attendee level or maybe, you know, the sponsor level, maybe not, maybe so to a degree. Um, but being able to tie it from the moment that person attended your event to what happened after the event to to eventually the conversion at the end, what program they invested in as a result is absolutely doable. So creating those kind of conversion streams and be, being able to report out on that way is is huge. And it all, like you said, it ties back to the data. There was something that um, you, you mentioned, Ron, on the member on the membership side that kind of struck me as as interesting. Um, and then, kind of to your point, Amy, about you know how they're we can't just start thinking about like this is only an event lane, and there, it doesn't have any of these kind of member community nonprofit, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, focus area benefits. And, and I think we're getting pretty close to the point where we're going to be able to start understanding the individual time allocation, or at least estimates around it, uh, that these events require. And so it's effectively the opportunity cost, because people aren't just paying for their hotel and their flight and their badge badge, they are, but they're also paying for all the things that they're not doing because they're engaging in your event whether that is virtual hybrid or in person and so i wonder if we get to the if we get to the point where that form of time currency because we're already kind of seeing the nuggets i don't know about what you guys see on your side but folks are registering later and later they're trading off their time on site for predictability and reliability on the experience they're waiting for more of the program to come out before they commit and they're willing to pay a higher price for that and then they're determining who to who to send so i think this is actually happening we just haven't quantified it yet no i sure. no yeah. i i absolutely absolutely agree um yeah and i it is it's the time currency data currency that's exactly what it is it's this intangible thing that um that we're not necessarily seeing um but we're in the place right now where you know we will be able to i think it will all surface and we'll say oh yeah okay this is where the event should be um this is where we should be with events okay i'm going to ask one hard question on the way out yeah. we got two minutes omni channel we talked about email being the primary channel rank order your top three or four channels in omni channel and it doesn't even have to be by performance maybe by you know you might say hey these are my top three favorites because they're the easiest to execute or they're the most bang for your buck or help help us understand what what makes sense from an omni channel standpoint um uh so you mean literally just channels literally um, just channels okay i think um i think i am huge on i would say content you know 
content marketing. I, I, you can see it as a channel, um, but it is, it's huge. It, it, to me, it anchors everything, right? Um, from the landing pages to, you know, and there are ways that to websites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's a big one. Um, I think, um, I actually think text is coming in more and more, SMS. Um, even for associations, I think there's a place. I think once again, that's a little more um, obscure as to how it's going to come in. Um, I see it as more informative and in some cases almost transactionally based. And then, I don't know, Ron, you wanna chime in on the last one? Yeah, I mean, the workhorse is still okay. email. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> okay. the, you know, the workhorse is still email, but I think the, the kind of Mary of what you were saying is it's to drive them somewhere. Right, so you really need to have yeah. um, basically uh, a content marketing approach, and email is just a way to push people to pull them, right? And so, um, and you want to get them to the to the site and have them kind of engaging and interacting more, because you know people don't wake up every day thinking about your organization and your message. So this is just a nice little kind of reminder, but you got to know what to remind them about in terms of what they value right in terms of where they want to spend their attention and, yeah. and that's you know the omni channel is not just the outbound but it's also kind of the inbound and the consumption and understanding okay what is that telling you about this individual in terms of what they value and then basically kind of you know not you know tricking them right it's just surfacing what you do but highlighting of the 10 things that membership means these are the three that amy values so let's go ahead and, and 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 highlight those things to Amy. You know. Mm -hmm. Or at the bottom, thank you very much, Amy. Amy two slash Ron. Thanks very <laughs> much for your time and your insights today, Ron. I think you just gave us the the next title of our next webinar. You got to push them before you can pull them. There it is, there right there. Go. There it is. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah thanks for absolutely. joining in. Eric, anything till next week? No, uh, unless you had anything you wanted to show just to kind of close it up from a visual standpoint. Oh, yeah. Let me get it up here. Thanks very much to our partners and our integration partners with Bear IQ. We're going to see you all, I think, October 5th. That is that is next week. Hard to believe it's already October. We do have our next webinar on the 5th. So join us and stay tuned, folks. Look forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.